What's up everybody and welcome back. Well, it's time for part three and we're going to be running over quite a few things today and I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet and I don't wanna waste a whole lot of time on this intro, so let's get it going. If you haven't had a chance to see part one or part two, I have provided the links down in the description below as well. You're going to see them pop up over here throughout the course of the video. So just be paying attention to those if you haven't seen part one and part two. Now, you don't have to have seen those in order to get some information out of this one. But if you haven't, I recommend going back and taking a look at it. And as always, I want to make sure that if you are not subscribed, please do so. Go ahead and click down there, click the like button, share it to other people. There's a lot of good information in these videos. And I'd like you to be part of the community and uh, come on this long journey with me. In the last video, I talked about how you could combine mechanical aeration and aerate and get a better result in subsoil compaction. And uh, those PSI readings were pretty cool to see, especially as everything else uh, and every other repetition that was done, the compaction sort of increased over the course of the year. Now, there were some questions about this uh, as far as how did the air rate do against the control. So uh, here's some numbers based on what those two did sort of as a side by side. Now, pretty much in every single repetition, uh, the soil started at one point and it moved and it fluctuated throughout the season. And there were points during the season that both the air rate and the control and even some of the other plots actually were heavier compacted and then they sort of eased back. Then there were other ones that just sort of climbed throughout the course of the season. Now, the air aid alone did have that effect where it sort of roller coastered. It went up and then it sort of came back down. But in the end, all that really was impacted was these top two inches and not necessarily the deep subsoil. So with that being said, I wanted to make sure that everybody got an idea that if we did do a deeper soil application by using a mechanical aerator and then applying aerate with it, you would actually see a greater benefit in the deep subsoil. So here's number one, I'm gonna go ahead and put a limit on aerate as far as affecting deep subsoil, at least in year one. Now I need to make a point that over the course of this study, we did do four applications of the product. We never went to the high rate of nine ounces. We kept it in that lower application rate, but we did do four applications with that material. On the part where we did the combo that was the mechanical and the air rate itself, just those two, it only got two applications and you could see how well that performed. So one of the limits is going to be that if we are applying to the surface of the ground and putting that down, the material has to be able to work its way down through the soil in order to have a greater impact. So it's going to take some time before subsoil is impacted rather than if you had a deep tine aerator like the one that was used on this trial that was getting a four inch core, we were able to get the material down deeper into the soil and because of all of the other fractures and everything else that happens with an aerator, it had an impact down in the subsoil. So what about water holding capacity? Well, really there wasn't a huge shift in how much water was being held in the control versus any of the aerate plots. The one where it had the, I'm going to call it the greatest reduction in water holding capacity was the combo of aerate and mechanical. In every measurement related to volumetric holding capacity, that one was actually the lowest because the soil was draining really, really quickly. It wasn't actually holding very well. So the one that would be just a step up from that, that did marginally better, was the aeration only. It was moving water pretty quickly. So the reason behind that is because the subsoil compaction was greatly relieved, so water was able to move through and drain faster. That's really the main reason that you get that. The second reason is there is soil being removed in that study, and therefore your volume of soil is decreasing as well. And with that, you're going to have a reduction on overall volume that water can be held in. So there, there is some changes that happen in there. In every rep where air rate was applied, water was holding pretty decent and same with the control site. So at one point, it's going to hit up against the more compacted soil and there's just only so much volume that the soil can actually hold no matter what. Now, one thing that I should point out because it's come up in other conversations is the concept of, is this working like a wetting agent and making water wetter? Well, 
No. What would happen on most of these trials is actually after the first application, the soil was a bit tighter after the application rather than loosening up like you would see with a wetting agent. So with a wetting agent, you get a surface tension release of the water and the water tends to be able to slip through and drain quicker, get down into the ground faster, which can have a lot of benefits if you're applying it with other things uh, that need to get down into the soil. So they work great and they do what they're supposed to. The difference with the aerate is there is a lot of carbon material in there as well that actually has to get watered in, otherwise it won't make it down into the profile. So it's one of those that while there may be questions about it, it doesn't work the same way. It's not able to immediately drain into the soil like you would see with anything that is a wetting agent. In the first video, I showed how the root mass increased in the mechanical aerated section as well as in the aerate plot. So I think we should talk a little bit about that as well. Basically what you were seeing is an enhanced rooting from more of a hormonal effect, uh, a biostimulating effect from the aerate. So with the mechanical aeration, the roots are going to move into those open pockets and fill it up. And you know, that's basically what it's designed to do. One thing that we noted throughout the trial was that at one point later in the summer, there was a time when the roots sloughed off and it was between the second and third measurements of total root mass. So the root mass actually was cut by about 65% at one point during the summer across the entire test area, not just the aerate section, but every single area where there was a repetition happening. So it sort of pinpointed the time in the season in which the Bermuda was shedding its roots. Now, why is that important? That is soil food, and that is something that is going to get used up by the microbes and the soil life that's down in there that you're working with. And it's vitally important and it's part of the regular uh, growth and cycle of turf grass. Sometimes you get two sheds a year, sometimes it's one big one. There's all of this different time where roots will shed off and slough and then they will regrow. So when we took a look at the trial, it started at one point and it ended in another, but partway through it was reduced by 60 to 65% and then grew back out over the remaining portions of the trial. The beauty of that is if we're adding more roots, if we're able to get more down into the soil early on, which is vitally important, growing bigger root mass, and then it does this slough, there's just more material to hold through those stressful times where it might be more dry and soil moisture is down. So the more of that root mass and root material that we can have in the soil, the more it works like a sponge and will keep your lawn from going into deep stress. The biggest root mass gains that were done throughout the trial were with the aerate and the RGS together. Those actually just blew everything out of the water without any disturbance of the soil on the surface by pulling plugs, which is pretty cool. Now one would think that the greatest increase in root mass might have come from the area that had the aerate and the mechanical applied. And while it did extremely well, its boost was closer to about a 70%, maybe a 75% overall root growth gain. So I think when you look over all of this and start weighing out what's going to be the best for you, there are things to consider. And here's how I would sort of list them out in the way that you could make the best choices for your lawn. Number one, are you really dealing with super compacted soil? And what I mean by that is, do you get a lot of standing water? Is that something that happens a lot? Uh, if, can you push a screwdriver down deep into the soil? How compacted is it down under the surface? Now, if your answer is extremely compacted, then you need to start with a little more of an aggressive intervention, and that's where mechanical aeration is going to shine. But then we also show that if you add aerate to the top of that, you get an even greater relief that lasts a lot longer and maybe will allow you to skip major aeration events in the future. The second thing to look at is cost. What does it cost you to do the aeration? Is it expensive? Are you renting it? Are you having somebody else do it? What's your annual cost to have this done for you on your lawn? Okay, it can get pretty expensive. When you're taking a look at something that you can buy from one of our online retailers in a package or you can buy as a single gallon, it's as low as 50 cents a thousand. And that's not really very expensive. If you have a 10,000 square foot lawn, it costs you about $5 per application. So say you had super compacted soil and you wanted to run it multiple times a year. Okay, well, it's still gonna be 50 cents a thousand no matter how many times you do it. So it stays pretty consistent and it's something that can be done at any time of the year and not really have to worry about anything. So what about this? Your soil's compacted later in the season and you're worried you're going to interfere with anything you put down uh, with your pre-emergent. Well, you don't really wanna poke holes in it because you might cause some breakthrough. 
Well, this is another area where the Air 8 can be a better suited solution for you, where you can get it out and have an impact on that soil and start working it down. And then maybe next year or at the end of the season, you do run your mechanical aerator and go ahead and break things up that you notice that were extremely compacted. One of the big reasons that people do like running the spray is because they don't have a mess and they don't have cleanup and they don't have broken sprinkler heads and they don't have broken this or that. And, and it's not a pain in the butt. That's one of the big reasons why customers all around the country choose this method because simply they don't want to deal with that mess. I think that's something to consider, but does it have to be the reason why you choose one way or the other? Not really. The results that you get from using the material really make the biggest impact. Not necessarily is it cleaner or dirtier. So, you know, while I've said there are certain limitations with doing a liquid, you are going to get some pretty major benefits. And now again, this is all first year data and there's going to be a lot more that comes out on this over the course of the next year but building a program and using material and having it stack on top of each other continues to produce results over and over and over again especially season to season as total plant health and soil health improves so when i look over this trial and the data that we're collecting and trying to see exactly where we can have the greatest benefit with everything i am left with something very simple that I think people need to understand. Your lawn is not a lab and it doesn't need to be treated like a lab. What happens in a six by six plot is very interesting because you can glean some data that's scalable to take out over a much wider range. But each and every one of you have a different soil, a different soil type, a different growing climate, different watering needs, different, 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 different. But here are the main factors that we've seen consistently across the board. Increased rooting, for sure. Increased water drainage, for sure. Softer soil, for sure. All of those things are super, super important and we've seen that in every condition. My hope is that at the end of this and you've seen all three parts, is that you can just make an educated decision on what's going to be the best application for your property. Whether it's sticking to mechanical, whether it's sticking to liquid, whether it's doing two, whether it's doing mechanical by itself, and then later switching to liquids, whatever it is, you get to make the decision. You are the master of your castle. And really, there's no one who can dictate what's good or bad for you and your lawn in the choices you make in keeping it healthy. That's it. That's the end of part three. I appreciate everybody being a part of this. I'm hoping to not have to talk about it for a while now because spring is on us and it's about time to get back out on the lawn. So thank you everyone for being a part of this, for commenting, for sharing, and for being open and willing to listen and see the data and truly use it as you see fit. I will talk to you guys real soon. See ya.